Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been a dream of mine since probably about 2009 when I first went to Penn State Symposium, Penn State, uh, Plum Symposium East um, at State College, Pennsylvania. Um, and at the time when I, when I was there, it was hosted by Penn State's Webline Group, which does Plum for its, its uh, campus. Um, I was really jealous, and it had always been my dream to surpass <laughs> what Webline was doing. Um, and then I realized they, they were doing such a great job, it, it was gonna be very hard to surpass. So finally, last year, we got, uh, we got the opportunity to host the symposium here with all the great facilities that we've built on campus in the last few years, um, SAGE, Horizon, Student Rec and Wellness Center, and of course, the Premier Waterfront Hotel. So we've been really pleased to have everybody here to, to be able to show off what we've got here. So Webline, I want to thank Webline's group uh, for having helped us, so many people in the Plone community, and for having hosted the symposia for five years, and then for helping so many of their members, their team members, have helped us transition to here and help plan this event. I also want to thank Mark Clements, the Director of Administrative Computing, and Nick Dvorak, who will be speaking, who's our CIO, for supporting everything that we've done with Plone here and for supporting our our long efforts to get everything organized for this event. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go through and thank a lot of people because <laughs> without all these people and these sponsors and, and individuals who just stepped up and, and just did so many amazing things, this would not have been possible. So we have a whole set of sponsors uh, who help in various ways. Um, our provost office, UW Oshkosh Foundation. We have the Plone Foundation, Six Feet Up, uh, Jazz Carta, Wild Card Systems, Contextual Corp, and the TriPython User Group from North Carolina, UNC, and Enfold Systems. Um, and of course, our trainers who came and gave great training, and the participants in the classes who took advantage of the opportunities. I also want to point out who the event team people are, so in case any of you have any questions or need anything, you can recognize us. So if I could get the event team members to stand up, please. So could you maybe turn around? Thank you. <laughs> if you need anything, find one of us, or there's always people at the front at the registration desk as well. So all right, so now I'm just gonna go through a laundry list of little announcements. Uh, if you're tweeting anything, please use the PSM13 hashtag. Um, and you can check the PSM13 hashtag for updates as the day goes on. Uh, lunch will be in Reeve Union, which is across the street and to the right. Uh, just follow a number of us, we'll be heading over there. So lunch will not be in here, it'll be over in Reeve Union. Um, where during lunch, we'll have Eric Steele's State of Plone talk, as well as lightning talks uh, following that. So. Lightning Talks, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's, uh, is it three minutes or five minutes? Five, five. Five, thank you, five minutes, during which you can stand up and talk about anything you want to talk about. You can rant, you can rave, you can show off software, or ask people to help you for the sprints or the birds of feather sessions later um, today and tomorrow. So that's five minutes, and there'll be a cowbell, just like at Penn State, <laughs> if you go over time. Yes? Um, we were going to put the sign-up sheet by the, during, in the lunchroom, but is that okay? Or if you want to tweet it, first tweeter wins, I guess. <laughs> okay, um, these couple of schedule changes, um, Alan Runyon, so the co-founder of Plone, will be speaking in the time slot that's in the, in your printed schedule, the time slot that I was in this afternoon at 440 in this room. So Alan Runyon will be here, so he's come up from Texas, um, and I think he called his talk rantings or ravings of a Runyon. So it'll be very interesting and very entertaining as usual. Uh, he's, he's not really opinionated. <laughs> and the last uh, schedule change is that uh, we'll be hosting, we'll be holding open strategic discussions about Plone vision, strategy, roadmap, community processes, 
at 5.30. I know this is a very packed schedule. It's going to be a long day. But if you want to have input in what's going on or you want to have your say, please come. It'll be both days here in this room at 5.30, so today and tomorrow. So that's on the electronic schedule. So um, if you go to the website, we'll write it down. Um, it's on there as well. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to, what, sorry? Oh, who am I? <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm Kim Nguyen. Uh, I've been doing Plone here for about 10 years, and uh, I'm just the convener of the meetings, and uh, the, the hat really doesn't signify anything. <laughs> so um, am I handing over to you? You're going to him. I'm going to him. Oh, sorry. And so with that, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Nick Dvorak, our CIO. Okay, I guess I'm the official welcomer to UW Oshkosh. So in addition to being uh, currently, I'm CIO, but I'm also Director of Learning Technologies. So I'm really excited about showing off uh, the classroom technology in Sage Hall. I hope you make use of it. I hope two displays is, is enough for you guys, but we, uh, we could probably roll in a projector if you really need a third, sorry. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Kim, where'd he go? Um, I, you know, he's the one who came up with this idea, and I remember them when he was standing in my office door and originally proposed this idea to me, which, uh, again, when I wrote that line, I realized, Kim, could you come in and sit down in my office sometime? Do you always have to... Hour-long meetings with Kim standing in the office door, so we'll <laughs> have to work on that. And I'd also like to recognize the local posse who works for me, uh, Brian Ledwell, uh, John Hren and Luke Scorchio, uh, who were way too much into picking out the conference swag. <laughs> and I'd also like to acknowledge the provost, my boss, uh, for providing some financial support in the UW Oshkosh Foundation, and also the people in continuing education who, uh, who run the conference output engine. You, you pour all this stuff in and pfft, out comes a conference. It's like magic. Um, <laughs> At UW Oshkosh, we got involved, I guess I think it was fairly early in Plone, 2004, 2003, 2004. Um, and this was a time when the university wasn't putting a lot of resources into web development at the time. Yet we had been given a mandate to increase the consistency and uh, the general identity and, and identity and recognition of our website. And in the early days of this, um, the mandate was to increase the consistency so that departmental websites listed the requirements for majors and their general education offerings, their academic offerings, more cons in a more consistent manner so students could make better choices. Sounds like a job for a content management system. And... Um, we were just a bit lucky that at the time, Kim's wife, who is a professor in our history department, needed a website to support her professional organization, the International Medieval Studies Society. And I really haven't heard the whole story, but Plone was the tool that was chosen to use to support that. Um, by the way, she was in a workshop with me the other day, and she corrected my Latin. <laughs> um, um, I, but I love the fact that this story has an academic beginning. Did I mention that the provost is my boss in the Division of Academic Affairs? Well, and as I said, at the same time, the resources were pretty scarce for web technology. And at that time, there was a movement among UW system to schools to adopt a commercial content management system, which, to be honest, wasn't even in the realm of financial possibility. Um, but while this discussion was going on, now I'm a little bit of an ivory tower nerd, but one thing that struck me was that, in addition to an unbeatable license price, um, one thing that open source software offered the IT staff was the ability to participate in that part of the mission of the university that talks about the discovery and dissemination of knowledge. What a great 
paradigm for open source software. It's the first sentence in our mission relates to the discovery and dissemination of knowledge. Um, so it's research, if you will, but in this case, it's research that solved practical day-to-day -day business solutions for the university and saved us about 100 grand a year um, in other things that we didn't have to do. So I think we were uh, fortunate in our adoption of Plone because to me it looks like Plone is not simply a content management system, but it includes this muscular back end for forms creation, forms processing, database management, and workflow uh, going down the line. I think we have probably avoided creating a whole plethora of portal-like, define portal somebody in less than three days, uh, portal-like and other shadow systems that we can do all with inside the Plone environment. Um, and another impression that I get about Plone is that unlike other, some other more popular open source software, Plone seems to get adopted and integrated into the processes of institutions and businesses that have made a commitment to being part of the Plone development community. And um, this may limit the overall popularity of Plone. Uh, not, not everyone can do that. But I think this is the real secret to the successful implementation and particularly support of open source software. And again, just as research is essential to effective and truly university level teaching, participating in the development is integral to really successful use of open source software. Um, this sort of distinction is often viewed a little with a little bit of suspicion, but you know, hey, if nerds were afraid of being pop unpopular, it would be a different world. But I prefer the, to view this instead as we fortunate few who have this marvelous machine at our disposal. So uh, please enjoy the conference, enjoy Sage Hall and the campus. Can't say anything about the weather, uh, but I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So, Brian Ledwell. I am, I am here to introduce Grace Lim, and uh, she sent me some pointers for things that I could say about her. But I, I thought it was kind of amusing, the, um, the little paragraph that comes before her pointers to, to talk about, and I kind of wanted to, uh, to actually read what she gave me uh, to, to, uh, to say about her introductory remarks. You can make this stuff up if you want. It's pretty straightforward. I figure you could lull them to a sense of complacency within this intro, then I can whack them with a ton of ridiculousness. <laughs> and now for the actual uh, introduction. Uh, Grace Lim has interviewed federal lawmakers and Hollywood stars, covered natural disasters, floods, earthquakes, and hurricanes, and man-made ones, airplane crashes, multiple homicides, and high-profile divorces. She now teaches multi-platform storytelling at UW Oshkosh, where she's also the editor of Plone Beyond Classroom Wall's website. Please join me in welcoming Grace Lim. Thank you. You know, I should have started that with, this is off the record. <laughs> When I saw the other keynotes, uh, Influence as a Soul of Leadership by um, Dr. Curtis Odom and the uh, mysteriously titled Liz Elizabeth Letty, <laughs> I kind of had a minor panic attack. I thought, man, I really need to have a title with pizzazz. So for the past few weeks, I spent every waking hour thinking, 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 title, title, title then it came to me, the perfect title for a Plone Symposium. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oddly
oddly enough, my husband, who's a math professor here at UW Oshkosh, nixed this title. He said, what does that even mean? <laughs> Do you even know what plone is? And I'm thinking, huh. Then I threw the question back at him. Do you know what plone is? Just as I thought, nada. I believe I won that round. <laughs> so, you know, nevertheless, I, instead of this catchy title, I went with Plone Ranger, free and unmasked. <laughs> now, I know what all of you want are takeaways from these keynotes. And it's really important for you to take something away from mine other than the thought, boy, that was one hour I'll never get back. <laughs> now, before we get there, we have to start from the beginning. I know you're thinking, who are you and why are you talking to me? I'm glad you asked. You know, let me. All right, so like I said, we got to start from the beginning. I am the daughter of a dirt poor preacher man who, is, um, who grew up from the mountains of Taiwan. Taiwan is such a small country. It's uh, oh, halfway around the world. It's so small that you can fit the island country in the state of Florida four times and still have room to spare. I come from a culture that um, places great value on the male child. And I come from a culture where the uh, baby girls are considered less than optimal. Fortunately for me, my parents did not agree with that school of thought. They saw value in us. They saw value in me. They brought us to America. When I came to America, I did not know the language of this country. Um, my teachers are the ones who opened a new world of possibilities to me. They gave me the tools to live and to thrive. They taught me to read. They taught me to write. And I learned that if you learn how to write well and you write well, you have the power to persuade. Now, this was not in my bio, but I am a professional marathoner. Now you're thinking, do we have a, the, you know, the LeBron James of professional marathoning here in our midst? I am here to say, yes, you do. If LeBron were a donut-loving woman who hates to run, <laughs> then yes, I am the LeBron James of professional marathoning. Now, when I say I run marathons, I, I, I really just plod through them. By the time I finished a race, the winners could have done the course twice, stopped and have dinner in the movie, did that stop me from pursuing my dream as a corporate sponsored athlete? Of course not. This is America where dreams come true. Now, when you're you know, training for a marathon, you spend tons of hours running mile after mile. All that fresh air and jostling made me ponder questions that plague us all. What is the meaning of life? What is the, my role in this world? How come Serena Williams has sponsors and I don't? <laughs> you know, my friends who are much faster than me, they wait for me to catch up and they say, uh, perhaps, just perhaps, it's because you're slow and whiny. <laughs> that can't be it. So I made the bold declaration. I'm going to get myself a corporate sponsor. When I look at the elite marathoners who get sponsorships, you know, it, came per, you know, it was perfectly clear to me. The companies who sponsor these elite athletes are not getting the best bang for their marketing buck. You know, these, the world's best in the marathon run at 26.2 miles in just a little over two hours. They whiz by eight stations. They hardly make eye contact, so they're so focused on winning. And, you know, me, I stop at every single aid station. I, you know, chat with volunteers. I high five little kids. I take uh, uh, phones on my cell phone. I am on the race course for a long, long time. I could <laughs> guarantee these companies way more than twice the exposure. You know, and I've had my game face on three times as much. 
I could be the slow moving billboard for these companies. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can't relate to the world class athletes who trim point two, you know, point zero zero two seconds off their time. You know, I may be you know, in awe of her winning ways, but I'm not really inspired by her. Um, I'm inspired by people who run even though they know they can't win. And for people who know me, know that I'm all about the journey and not about the win. <laughs> so I wrote to several national companies, you know, willing them to see the beauty of this idea. I said, I wrote, my name is Grace Lim, and I'm a world, I am a back of a pack marathoner, and I'm seeking your sponsorship. Several years ago, so okay, you know, okay, more than several years ago, I ran the New York City Marathon as a bona fide corporate sponsored athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I had 22 signs on my running clothes. Uh, and this is a picture of me with a Sports Illustrated, Sports Illustrated photographer taking a picture of me. Okay? <laughs> but I'll cut to the chase. I came in 34,350th place. <laughs> That's right. 3450, uh, whatever it is. The numbers usually roll off my tongue, but yes. But you know, I mean, 94% of the runners finished ahead of me. I later found out a guy with only one leg beat me. <laughs> and I was actually beat by a guy juggling five balls the entire way. <laughs> but you have to ask yourself, did he stop and chat with people? Did he jump the police do not cross line and, and, and take pictures with these cute firefighters? <laughs> um, did he stop at mile 12 and have a coffee from Leche? <laughs> or, or a beer at mile 18? I, I, don't, I don't think so. My nutty quest for corporate sponsorship generated more than 70 um, media attention from more than 70 publications, including the New York Times, uh, Runner's World, and Her Sports, and Michael Feldman's uh, National What Do You Know? Okay, so after that radio interview, a CEO of a uh, software company contacted me asking for the, the ad space on the back of my shirt. And I was, I was just joking when I said, I'm sorry, but that premium space is locked up by my national sponsor, Horny Toad. So he said, well, what do you have left? And I said, I have some leg space left. And then he said, I'll take it. <laughs> I believe that was the first time I ever used the words leg and space quite in that way. <laughs> All this from a simple letter that began with, my name is Grace Lim, I am a back of pack marathoner, and I'm seeking your sponsorship. My husband now is a firm believer of my persuasive writing skills. He said, write to Honda, we need a new car. <laughs> you know, so before I um, came to Oshkosh, I've been a journalist for more than 20 years, and one of the cool things about being a journalist is that you get to hang out with cool people who do cool things like, Jackie Chan, Justin Timberlake, you know, Bon Jovi, who I still think looks pretty hot. But um, even the time, you know, the year I was with the tabloids, uh, Star Magazine, yes, the supermarket tabloid, where three rumors equal fact, um, you know, I had a blast. And during that year, I tailed Liz Taylor to Acapulco, and I am sorry to say I ticked off Oprah. Just an aside, if you're me, Oprah, you don't know me. <laughs> so, but being a reporter is not all fun and games. I mean, there are some, um, some assignments that are pretty tough, really, I mean, incre incredibly excruciating. The time I had to hang out on South Beach with Anna Kornikova. Um, for those of you who don't know who Anna Kornikova is, she's a tennis, a, a former tennis pro who is known more for her looks than for her tennis skills. During the entire time you know, in the photo shoot, I had to keep myself from yelling, you're 15, put some clothes on. <laughs> well, I enjoyed doing the celebrity beat. It was really the stories that um, were about regular folk that really affected me. 
like this guy who ran into a fireball um, to save a motorist, or this murderer who found salvation in prison, or this homeless mother who stays awake at night to make sure her mother of her children are safe. These are the stories that make a mark. South Florida was forever changed in 1992 when Hurricane Andrew um, struck. That hurricane left 160,000 people homeless. It um, destroyed 120,000 homes. Oshkosh is a city with 65,000 people. Now imagine the entire city of Oshkosh and the entire city of Green Bay, home of the world famous Green Bay Packers, homeless. But good came out of that devastation. Strangers helped strangers and opened their homes to those who have lost their homes. Everyone at the Miami Herald, from the publisher down, worked the hurricane. My husband, who did not work for the newspaper, got involved. He drove me around on the day of the hurricane and um, took photographs as I um, interviewed victims. The newspaper used one of those photos with my stories that were sent out on the wire. That year, the Miami Herald won the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of Hurricane Andrew. I mean, yes. And I was standing next to syndicated columnist, humor columnist, Dave Barry, when the prizes were awarded, I mean, announced. And somebody asked him, what does that mean that the Miami Herald won the Pulitzer Prize? And he said, what this means is right after this meeting, everybody's going to go back to the computer and update their resume and add the words Pulitzer Prize winner. I am so proud to say, you know, my husband teaches here at UW Oshkosh. He is the only math professor in that department with a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I called my parents that night and I said, Mom, guess what? The Miami Herald won the Pulitzer Prize. And she said, the what? I said, the Pulitzer Prize. And she said, I said, it's a big prize for people in the newspaper business. And she said, the what? You gotta understand something about my mom. She still tells her friends that Grace is going to be the next Connie Chung, a TV journalist. No, never mind that I had been a uh, you know, in the newspaper and magazine business for 20 years. I said, you know what, forget it. Get me dad. So I told dad. <laughs> I said, dad, guess what? The Miami Herald won the Pulitzer Prize. And he said, the what? And my father said, it's like an Oscar. And he said, that, that got his attention. He said, he called to my mom, Grace won an Oscar. <laughs> mom told dad to get off the phone because she has called all the relatives back in Taiwan to tell them about their latest uh, my latest achievement. So here's the heads up. If you ever find yourself in Taiwan and you tell people you're from America or you've been to America, you will be asked, oh, do you know Grace Lim, the Oscar winner? <laughs> I am here to tell you that, and give you permission to respond. Yes, I do. And do you know, also know that she's a world-class marathoner? <laughs> it is to my, the deep sadness of my three imaginary fans that I've uh, given up professional marathoning. I have since learned that there are uh, less painful ways to abuse my body, like um, competitive eating. And speaking of eating, is, is, it, is it lunch yet? What do you mean not yet? When is lunch? It's at noon. Noon? It's like 9.30 already, you know? I mean, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, for for a long time ago, my husband followed me to Miami where I had my job at you know, the Miami Herald and People magazine. We had an agreement. He followed me first. And so it was only fair that after he earned his PhD that I followed him to Oshkosh, a place where People magazine didn't really feel like a, um, there was a need for a full-time correspondent. <laughs> and just go figure. Fortunately, the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh did not hold <coughs> against me any journalistic transgressions I may or may not have committed in my youth. I deny everything, even if it's true. I love my job here at UW Oshkosh. I get to teach students how to tell great stories. But I couldn't do it without help. You know, I have this great go-to team. And I really don't like talking about them too much because they're just that good. Um, and, I, and people who know me know I don't like to share. Um, Brian, on the <laughs> Brian on the left, he is uh, my main clone guy. He is the uh, multi uh, university's multimedia developer. He makes all the stories my students and I do look great on the web. Um, the guy on the right is Wayne Abler, 
Uh, he's my video guy, which to my chagrin is not my, um, that's his not, that is not his official um, job title. And, um, oops, Sean McAfee is my partner in all my student faculty projects. She is my art director, my sounding board, and she likes to think she's the voice of reason. You only need to look at the uh, um, unauthorized official Plone Ranger poster to see the kind of artful magic she's a, um, capable of. Yeah. They, and the, they and the people in the University's Learning Technologies are, um, you know, they truly live their credo to support instructional staff. Even the, even the ones that burst into their offices with oddball requests like, ah, uh, please make magic. And they do. As an instructor, I teach students that stories have great power. And the stories that matter the most are the ones that give regular folk a name, a place, I mean, a name, a face, and a voice. Somehow, I last, lost sight of that, um, that lesson during a large pit class. I was talking about the media coverage of um, the wars in the Middle East. And there was a student that sat in the front row, and she kept giving me weird looks the whole time I was talking. Finally, I just couldn't stand anymore. I said, you know, what? What is it? And she said, you know what? The media does only cover a part of the story. They never talk about the good that the military is doing over there. And I'm looking at her, I'm thinking, she looks, she looks all of 14 to me. And I, said, and I said, how would you know what the military is doing over there? And she said, I was there. That student was an Iraq war vet. On that day, the student taught the teacher. You know, now that I know that I had students who are war vets, I wanted to know who they are. I want to hear their voices. I want to see their faces. So, so in other words, I needed a book filled with their stories. I need podcasts that, so I can hear their voices. I need photographs so I can see their faces. So I quickly went to the drawing board and, uh, with, and came up with this grand vision for this great website. You know, can <laughs> and, and Brian, my main plony here, um, knew exactly what I wanted. He could see the careful thought that went into this rendering <laughs> and proceeded to make magic. Now, I think we should look at it side by side. <laughs> it, it's kind of, it's like looking at identical twins. For the third war project, Brian made more magic in Plone, which allowed my students to easily upload their journals and stories to the site. My students now have produced more than uh, two 80-page books and a series of video and audio podcasts. We'll be unveiling the third volume of the war series this fall. These stories of our student vets touched people from all over the world. Our Beyond Classroom Wall website um, has received hits from people from you know, 80 countries, more than 80 countries. Re regardless of what your stance on the war is, these stories matter. The young man, um, this young Marine, who, who was the cover guy for our, our first war project, never told his mother that he had volunteered to be deployed. He had a buddy who had a pregnant wife and really didn't want to go. So John Jandron went to their commander and said, let me go in his place. When he told us that story, I said, you know, this is going in the book. This is going online. We're going to podcast this. Your mother is going to find out. <laughs> he kind of smiled at me and shrugged his shoulder. That was his way of telling his mom. Creative people like to think that everything they do is precious, and writers are no different. My students and I learned how truly precious our work was on March 20th, 2011. On that day, Craig Burkholtz, a Fond du Lac police officer, was shot and killed in the line of duty. Fond du Lac is about 20 miles south of here. He had served two tours in the Middle East, one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan. He was one of our student vets who was featured in the first war project. We captured his stories in print online in a 20 minute long podcast. We dedicated a second volume of the war series in part to his memory. We invited his parents to come to the event in November, and you know, it was a standing room only in the theater. His mom 
told us how much they treasure their, that one book. They only have one copy. They tried to get more, but it was sold out. The book, which contained photos of Craig and his story, was so precious to them that they keep it under glass. Sean, my art director, and I are mothers of boys. We can't fathom the, um, the depth of Mr. and Mrs. Burkholz's loss. And we found three more copies of the book, and we framed Craig's pages, and we presented these tokens to the Burkholz's at the November event. Their son died more than two years ago. But on that day, Mr. and Mrs. Burkholz were able to grieve openly with hundreds of people from the campus community and beyond. They were able to feel the gratitude of many for their son's ultimate sacrifice to his community as a police officer and his um, service to this country as a soldier. A week or so later, I received a card from the Burkholzes. I read in part, words are not enough to describe how you made us feel. The standing ovation for Craig was so incredibly moving. Your work in the student and the work of your students in telling the stories of our veterans' lives is so important. We encourage you to continue to tell their stories. These stories matter. As a reporter, I've interviewed sports stars and Hollywood celebrities, and I, you know, I'm kind of jaded by people who routinely flash and trash the hero label. You know, the most extraordinary of heroes are those among, who walk among us quietly without advertising their good deeds. In the town of Poygan, there is, which is outside of Oshkosh, it is a family of true heroes. This is Norm and Joyce Lee and their sons, Colin and Perry. More than 30 years ago, Norm and Joyce's son, Brian, then 20 years old, decided to snowmobile across Lake Poygan. This was two days after Thanksgiving, right after first freeze. Snowmobiling on frozen lakes is common in these parts. However, on that fateful day, Brian and three of his friends fell through the thin ice. Only one was saved. Brian and the others were too far away. The ice was too thin. Sun had set, and there were no ice rescue vehicles available. Perry, at that time, was only 16 years old. He knew his brother was out there. This is his brother that he worshipped. He tried to go after them. He grabbed the boat, a tiny little boat, and over the icy lake and said, come on, let's go, let's go. The police had to hold him back. It was too dangerous. Norm Lee decided that no other family should go through what his did. He helped purchase the area's very first rescue airboat. Not only that, he and his sons, Colin and Perry, brothers of Brian, became ice rescuers. For more than 30 years, They've been saving people off these lakes. They do this as volunteers. I am fascinated by people I don't understand. How is one able to cope with the tragic death of a loved one? How were the Lees able to transform their personal heartbreak into something greater than their overwhelming grief? I wanted to tell their story in so many ways. I could see it as a short documentary on the large screen. I could see it as a long magazine article with lots of photos. I worked with two film students, Mark Mazur and Trent Hilborn, who shot more than 24 hours of footage for the 17-minute documentary. Now, before I show you these behind-the-scenes clips, I, I do want to say one thing. No students were harmed in the making of this documentary. Without hesitation, Mark and Trent hung over the side of the airboat going at high speed to get the perfect shot. They went up on a small two-seater kit airplane to get shots of the lake. You know, when Sean and I watched the boys go up, up, and away, I, I turned to her and I said, um, you know how doctors have that oath, first do no harm? And she said, yep. And I said, uh, teachers don't have anything like that, do they? <laughs> Without hesitation, Mark and, well, you know, and she, ah. well, I have to say that Mark 
and Trent fully understood that the college learning experience was more than just about earning an A. For them, it was about getting the story and getting it right. This is how they described their learning experience to the UW System um, Board of Regents. Hi, my name is Trent Hilborn, and this is Mark Mazur, and we survived a Graceland project. <laughs> the thing that I remember most about the airboat project is probably the very first day when we got on that boat and <laughs> we got on this airboat and then they just gunned it and we're just flying across the ice and um, I look over to Trent, he's hanging off the boat I'm shooting backwards trying to get Perry's off to the side of me Grace has the headphones on just kind of hanging on for dear life and I'm like how did I get here? A week ago I would have never been here so it's, I think it's pretty incredible how quickly things happen uh, especially working with Grace and Sean they just make stuff go and they make it happen and um, I, it's pretty awesome. Sean is like a cool summer day. You wake up and everything's relaxed and grace is like when Armageddon happens and just fire is raining from the sky. And <laughs> but you know what, that's the fun part is when the fire is raining from the sky, you know, you're really excited and you can do things you normally never be able to do. Where a cool summer day, you can't, can't go wrong with that. Yeah, you know, forget Mark and Trent. They um, graduated and they now own their own um, film uh, production company in the Twin Cities called A2F. Uh, you know, you should listen to what my students who did the war project had to say about their learning experience. When I heard that I had Grace Lynn for writing for the media, I was told that I was in for hell. Grace is probably the most dedicated teacher I've had since being at UWO, hence why most people think she's crazy. Hell. Crazy. Hell. Hence why most people think she's crazy. Hell. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, there seems to be a theme going on here. Um, what I'm, I'm trying to say is this. Um, my students and I get to tell cool, meaningful stories because my Plone team gave me the tools to do so. My students could have written for an audience of one, me, their instructor. But I wanted them to take greater ownership over their work. Let the stories go out there and see what comes of them. Because of these stories, Mr. and Mrs. Burkholz, um, and because of these stories that have been preserved online, Mr. and Mrs. Burkholz can read their son's words. They could hear his voice on his thoughts about peace and war, and they can take solace that their son's deeds have not been forgotten. When Airboat Rescue One, when the ice breaks, Premiered in 2010 in our downtown's Grand Opera House. More than 500 people showed up on a cold, cold day in January. We put the Airboat Rescue One um, story behind the story on the web. Soon, I received an email from a sheriff's deputy in Minnesota. He was trying to find resources about airboat rescues. He was trying to put together a training session. He googled airboat, rescues, ice, lakes, and found us. Deputy Gribble wrote, we had a man that went into the open water on the river between Minnesota and Wisconsin who spent an hour and a half yelling for help. Those trying to help him could not get to him. Finally, he quit yelling, and well, you know the rest. He asked for a copy of the Airboat Rescue One, which I was happy to give him, along with the 28-page companion magazine. Later, the chancellor of our university told me that he received a letter of thanks from this deputy who also sent me a copy of the letter. In the letter, the deputy said that he you know, first watched the documentary on, on his own. His wife usually doesn't pay attention to what he's watching on TV, stopped what she's doing, sat down, and watched it with him. By the end, both were in tears. Then the deputy showed the documentary to the airboat training workshop. This is what Deputy Gribble wrote about that first class. To appreciate the impact, I would like to set the stage for my class. Four deputies, 18 firefighters crammed into a small classroom directed to listen to me for eight hours. The room was alive with the testosterone and, agro <laughs> and egos. I was trying to teach a serious topic to what seemed to be a group of boys excited about a new toy. When the film was over, I let the credits run on the screen. Not one man moved, no jokes, no messing around. The room was silent. I turned up the lights and announced a break. After the break, I was looking at a new group, serious, 
focused, committed. I do not think many films could have had such a profound effect on a group of men. Deputy Gribble told me since, then that, since that day, he always starts his training sessions with a viewing of Airboat Rescue One when the ice breaks. That, that always gets to me. Our stories are helping save lives, in part because of you. You plum people created something I only half jokingly call magic. You work together even though you may be thousands of miles apart. You created a CMS that allowed me and my students to publish our stories. You put our stories out there because our stories are touching lives and perhaps maybe even saving them. You, people of Plone, are unsung heroes. <laughs> While I aim to change that here and today, no longer will you be unsung. You see, I come from a school of thought that conference speakers should have original theme songs. <laughs> And, and, and cool prizes like the Plony Award to hand out. And when I mentioned this to my, my friend and colleague, Sean, you know, the voice of reason, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> she said, what, what, what school of thought is this? Does a school have only like one crazy person in it? <laughs> she's one to talk. Remember, she's the one who created the unauthorized official Plone Ranger poster. So, so to all the Plone Rangers, here and there, this song is for you. Howdy, y'all. Y'all wants to hear more about the Plone? Well, I got just the tune for that. Plone is like this and that I hear And other web software had better fear Those unenlightened are in a fog Four words <laughs> Wordpress is a blog Surely don't care if GoDaddy Went with that old CMS petty I fear no Drupal danger Because of the Plone Ranger I ho CMS Ranger, it is I, the Plone Ranger, primed for any task. The Plone Ranger, free and unmasked. Woo, boy, how do we know go have hooting and up in here without Plone? Just know that Plone is the best. It passes all of our security tests. Top secret people all use Plone, cause it's organic and homegrown. I could tell ya who, but then... Well then I'd have to kill y'all, and Plone Rangers do many things, but not that. I hold CMS Ranger, it is I, the Plone Ranger. Prime for any test, the Plone Ranger, free and unmasked. Woo! One more time! Hi ho, see a Master Ranger, it is I, the Plone Ranger. Prime for any test, the Plone Ranger, free and unmasked. Known is like this and that I hear, and other web software had better fear. Those unenlightened are in a fog for words. <laughs> WordPress is a blog. Surely don't care if GoDaddy went with that old CMS Eddy. I fear no Drupal danger because of the Plone Ranger. I ho CMS Ranger, it is I, the Plone Ranger, primed for any task. The Plone Ranger, free and unmasked. I'm McAfee, but she, uh, for this, she was the um, designer of art, real and imagined. Morgan Counts, my student intern back here, who has no idea how to put this on her resume. <laughs> the Plone Ranger li lip syncers are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, I'm sorry, it's Brian, Kim, Luke, and John. <laughs> And Stephen Heil, where's Stephen? Stephen over there is a student majoring in RTF, directed this wondrous uh, piece under great duress. I told him I needed a music video. I had a song 
two hours and a mighty whitey uh, horse named Sparkles. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce my faithful sidekick, Pronto. Can you turn the lights on? Um, my faithful sidekick, Pronto, who also goes by the alias Matt Muling, a classical viola student here at UW Oshkosh. As I said, viola. And he also plays fiddle for a great country band called the Bourbon Cowboys. And before we make Plone history with a Plone Ranger sing-along, <laughs> I'd like to hand out some prizes. I know everyone now is coveting the Plone Award. It is, where's my Plone Award? Okay. Here we go. The, all right. You know, the, the, it's, it's, it's a beaut. It's really a one-of-a-kind um, kind of thing. And I put a lot of thought on who should get this first Plony Award, and we're kind of, you know, we're kind of running out of time. So um, who arrived here on three planes and a bus and took 27 hours? Oh, oh you're kidding me. Come up here. <laughs> What is your... All right. Okay. Is it Franco? Right. Franco. 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 Okay. Well, you know what? Um, this is this is for you, but not really, um, because it's only one of a kind, and I, I kind of need to keep it. So you get. <laughs> but but this is what you get. Um, here, we're gonna put this here. It says Franco. All right. And we're gonna take a picture, and we'll send you a picture with me and Pronto and you. <laughs> Okay, all right, okay, and then you get to um, wear this, okay? Um, and, you know, if you guys know tabletop, I am I'm, like totally stealing this. And, oh, an official Plone Ranger badge. Here we go. Oh, oh. And a limited edition of the Plone Ranger Free in the Mask DVD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where's my thing? All right, so, okay. Slow it down. <laughs> I know my talk is titled Plone Ranger Free and Amassed, but deep down it's really called An Ode to Techies in My Life, You Complete Me. <laughs> it's been an honor to speak here today. When I told my mom I'm coming here, she was so proud. She said, why are you still on the phone? I gotta call my relatives in Taiwan. So I thank you. And my mother thanks you. And for the first and possibly last Plone Ranger sing-along. All right. <laughs> Pronto is going to sing the first couple of verses, and then you get to join in. <laughs> So if you would like, I can, you know, so thank you very much.
since now we're getting we're tight on time, right? When does the 